Uh, okay. I've just finished putting this together and a few things occur to me. Firstly, I'm going to be talking about a subject which is a complete oxymoron, nuclear weapons safety. Secondly, that subject is pure nightmare juice. So if you don't want to know about all the interesting ways that the world could end, fair enough, look away now. Third, there is some maths in this video, as well as a discussion of particle physics and one accidental reference to quantum mechanics, for which I can only apologise. Lastly, this is a really, really long video. I, I thought about how to try to break it up, but I couldn't really come up with a neat way of doing it. And since I suspect my audience is going to be pretty small for this kind of thing, I figure if you're interested enough, you'll probably stick here for the long haul. And if you do, I salute you. Thank you, brave viewer. I grew up in the 1980s, which makes me pretty old and pretty grumpy and probably a bit psychologically scarred and not just from the fucking weird TV adverts and the e-numbers that they pumped us full of. There was for everybody a certain knowledge that at any moment the sky could be ripped open, a thermonuclear fireball would kill everyone and everything, and that would be all she wrote. It was a constant drumbeat of pressure that, whilst kind of abstract and uncertain in day-to-day -day life, you could never quite forget it. It was always there. We had three television channels, no phones and no internet, so existential dread was kind of a national pastime in the UK. What I hadn't quite appreciated at the time was just how close the world had actually got to blowing itself up, not just in a theoretical way, but in an actual practical way on a number of occasions. The Cold War saw a massive build-up of nuclear and thermonuclear devices. It had dozens of what had been dozens of warheads in the 1940s had grown to a few thousand in the 1950s to tens of thousands in the mid 60s and by the mid 80s was something around 65,000 warheads globally. Although numbers have come down dramatically since the end of the Cold War and the easing of tensions, there are still thought to be about 12,500 warheads on or near delivery systems, about 90% of those in the hands of the US or the Russians, and about 1% in the hands of the UK. But watch this space, because the Chinese have never signed any of these agreements and couldn't give two fucks what anybody else thinks, and they are growing their arsenal at a rate of knots. Uh, let's worry about that another day. Aside from the obvious, nuclear bombs and missiles, the US and NATO developed a plethora of other uses for nuclear warheads. Uh, the Genie air-to-air missile, the BOMAC anti-aircraft missile, the Mark 45 nuclear-tipped torpedo, the RUR-5 nuclear anti-submarine missile, the SDAM nuclear demolition charges or atomic mines, the Davy Crockett nuclear bazooka, which if that sounds nuts to you, it really fucking is. I could go on. All these weapons had massive warheads for what were supposed to be battlefield deployable weapons. And the Soviets had versions of all of these as well. This wasn't a uniquely Western idea. So if you were the sort of lunatic that really wanted to see big explosions, then the US military was the place for you. And with drugs being used by 75% of military personnel before mandatory testing became a thing in the 90s, these weapons were in the hands of people who were probably quite stoned, which is a very comforting thought. However, we are still here, so no one actually deliberately fired any of them, which is nothing short of a miracle. But that miracle doubles up when you start to think about the implications of having a stockpile of tens of thousands of powerful weapons, big enough to erase cities from a map that no one used for long periods of time. The whole point here was deterrent. It was to convince the other guy that you had the weapons. If you were pushed hard enough, you could probably use them. And if they launched, you'd launch back. This ensured that hundreds of billions of dollars worth of weapons would well kind of just sit there for years, slowly degrading. They needed maintenance, they needed handling, they needed repair, they needed renewal, they needed upgrades, they needed to be put on and off ships, submarines, fighters, bombers, bases, trains, trucks, you name it. I'm not sure about you, but if I was handling a thermonuclear device, I'd be pretty fucking careful with it. However, these movements were necessarily routine. Bombers would sit on ground alerts fully loaded with fully armed nuclear weapons or fly close circuits near the Soviet borders. Missiles would have to sit in silos, fueled up and ready to go 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Fighters would take off and land armed with nuclear weapons. Submarines would dock, take on weapons, go to sea for months and then offload them at the end of a patrol. The opportunity for cock up and misjudgment for mistakes and accidents to trigger a third world war was, and indeed still is, huge. So great in fact that up until the mid-1980s, estimates for the human potential to cause nuclear accidents during handling was considered too complex to even be considered in the mathematical chances of our survival. 
things have improved and we'll talk about how at the end of the video, but weapons remain a danger to everybody and especially those who own and operate them. And what I'm going to focus on today is NATO and the US who are probably the gold standard in weapons handling. Imagine if you will, how poorly weapons might be controlled by say India, Pakistan, or even states like Iran and North Korea. To get an idea of the problem and indeed how to get around it, we should probably define some terms and get a handle on some of the issues. So let's Let's talk about power first. How do you tell how powerful an explosion actually is? Now, scientists love nothing more than firstly telling you what their unit of measurement is and then explaining all the ways that it doesn't actually work. So, for example, the prototype kilogram used to be a nice shiny chunk of metal held in France because, I don't know, it's probably Napoleon's fault, most things are, and is now based on the Planck constant, which is basically a branch of quantum physics because that standard kilogram wasn't considered to be precise enough. Look, I'm not a physicist, but I don't trust anything that requires me to measure my sugar for a cake mixture using a system which has things called strange quarks in it. I mean, seriously, how do you even treat that with any degree of seriousness? So the unit of boom, to get back to the point, is measured in a weight of TNT equivalent, which is set at 4.184 kilojoules per gram. That's an interesting number. There's a couple of reasons. Firstly, that is a mighty convenient measurement, being as it is precisely one calorie, as in one calorie from a packet of crisps or a bar of chocolate or whatever. That in itself is defined as the amount of energy required to raise a temperature in one litre of water by one degree, assuming an ambient temperature of 14.5 degrees Celsius. I told you these scientists were specific. So to put that a different way, your packet of Maltesers has an explosive power equivalent to 160, sorry, 186 grams of TNT. Probably worth considering next time you're feeling a bit peckish. Of course, you'd have to set the Maltesers on fire and I guess kind of hold it under a bucket. Whatever, you, you get the idea. Um, in 1944, the RAF developed a truly terrifying 22,000 pound bomb called the Grand Slam, designed to flatten entire factories or break open submarine pens or sink battleships. It had nine and a half thousand pounds of torpex on it. And that's a very, very explosive explosive. It's uh, roughly equivalent to 230,000 flaming packets of Maltesers. That sounds pretty impressive, but this is nothing compared to the first two atomic bombs, which had a yield of 13 and then 21 kilotons of TNT equivalent. That is, they explode with the force of 13,000 and 21,000 tons of TNT. These were what is known as fission bombs, meaning that the warhead was imploded and compressed to the point where atoms split apart, creating a serious amount of heat and light. However, atom bombs are only the gateway drug to nuclear annihilation, and by the mid-1950s, both the Soviets and the US had developed thermonuclear or fusion bombs. That is where atoms are forced together, creating conditions similar to that at the centre of a star, and they fuse, hence the term. These were so enormous that just to get them going, you needed a fission bomb as a detonator. On the 17th of October 1961, the Soviets tested the biggest ever bomb built before or since the Tsar bomber, with a yield of an unbelievable 50 million tonnes or 50 megatons of TNT equivalent. And everybody kind of stood back and went, holy shit, that is a lot of flaming packets of Maltesers. It's 747.5 billion packets, by the way, just in case you were curious. And they kind of stopped there because there was literally no point in building a bomb that big. All you were really doing was digging a bigger and bigger hole. A smaller weapon could take out a city and was necessarily smaller and lighter and therefore more flexible and more operationally useful. Said instead of trying to build bigger and bigger bombs, that they would go down the route of making more and more of them, which is very comforting. That's a quick overview of how we measure explosions, how big they got and how the numbers began to grow, why they began to grow. You eventually got too big and so you needed to make more, not larger. The questions which we need to think about last then is exactly how do you get a nuclear device to go boom? And there are a few parts to this. Sadly, YouTube isn't that keen for me to start showing you schematics and doing how-to guides to building your own bomb in your kitchen. So we're just going to talk about general principles and the important bits of the weapon. And I'm going to do this because this has a significant impact on the safety of weapons handling. The short answer is to get a nuclear device, you need explosives to make it explode. I mean, that sounds fairly logical, I guess. If you think about this, what you're going to try and do is you're going to shape some nuclear weapons, sorry, you're going to shape some standard explosives towards a central area. You're going to make the core implode. That's the object of the exercise. So you've got to make those explosives go. And if you're going to do that properly, you've got to focus that explosion in a particular point. That is, you've got to lens it. So you get these things which are called explosive lenses. To set off those primary mundane explosives, you need to get an electrical impulse that's incredibly intricate and carefully timed to get the whole thing to exert that pressure onto the core 
just so. You've got to trigger the explosions in a careful sequence and you've got to control it. And this electrical system is known as the X unit. If you know anything about combustion engines, think of this as the distributor in a petrol engine. It controls what electrical power goes where in a carefully timed sequence using a battery and very thin little wires. And in time, these batteries have become thermal batteries, which are just what the name implies. You use a single use battery, which would uh, create electricity during the course of melting itself and generating heat, which is also useful in a nuclear weapon. So if you think we've got our explosive shaped into lenses, we've got the X unit going, they're focusing the energy towards the target. Now we need to talk about the core itself. And actually there's a problem here. I'm using the wrong term. The term that you use in nuclear weapons isn't core, you talk about pits. Now pit to me is a hole in the ground, but apparently our ill-educated American cousins think that that means the hard stone in the center of a soft fruit or a pip as we more properly call it in English. Bless them, very clever and hardworking people, but English isn't their first language, which is why they pronounce this word as Arkansas, which is confusing because Arkansas is itself in Wisconsin. Whatever. Uh, we're in their world, we'll use their terms and be smug and British in the knowledge that they are completely wrong. The pit in a nuclear weapon refers to the thing you're going to try and implode and make go bang. So off the explosives go, focus the energy on the pit. Then what? Well, the pit itself needs to compress fast under pressure waves. In a fission bomb, at this point, a neutron cascade react goes critical. Vast numbers of neutrons swarm around. They crash into more material, typically uranium or plutonium, generating more neutrons and so on and so on and so on until you get a big bright flash that produces vast amounts of heat and x-rays. If the fission bomb is strapped carefully to the core of a heavy nitrogen isotope, then those x-rays can be used to focus power onto those, which in turn creates a ridiculous amount of heat in the hydrogen and actually causes it to fuse, hence the term fusion bomb, and you get enough energy released to wipe a city off the map and kill everybody within a few dozen miles instantly. So we've covered explosive lensing, we've covered X units, we've covered the central part of the bomb, the pits, and we've talked about how the bomb actually works. So let's put down our copy of H-bombs made from household materials and put it to one side for a second and turn our attention to what all of this means for safety. As I mentioned, the X unit a while back, here's a fun fact. During the development of the atomic bomb, they were building the first few of these X units and testing them out using either a light bulb or a camera shutter just to see if the thing worked. Essentially, that would turn it on. So at least two occasions, there were lightning storms building up over the desert when they were building these things, and they automatically triggered without anybody touching them, which was lovely. Had they been connected to an actual bomb, they would have gone off. I'm sure that was a very comforting thought for Donald Horing, who on the night of the Trinity test, the night before the Trinity test, found himself having to climb up a hundred foot tower and babysit the device in the middle of a lightning storm, precisely because they knew that static electricity could potentially trigger it. Even after the Trinity tests, the crew of the Enola Gay and the boxcar on their way to Hiroshima and Nagasaki respectively were advised to avoid thunderstorms because they thought there was a potential chance that the build-up of static could detonate the weapons in the halts. After the surrender of Japan in August 1945, Los Alamos found itself in possession of a third warhead, which they'd been prepared to drop as the third weapon should the first two fail. Unable to resist poking things with sticks, they began a series of criticality experiments. And I'm using experiments in the loosest possible sense here. They were to quote one of the scientists tickling the dragon's tail. That is that they were deliberately setting the core up amongst neutron reflectors to simulate what would happen during a detonation, but without the explosives, gradually increasing the reflections to see at what point the core would go critical. One might assume that they were doing this in some underground location using robot arms and wearing huge lead suits. No, no, not so much. They were doing it in their shirt sleeves and physically moving stuff about with their hands. First, Harry Daglin experimented late after dinner one night when he dropped a piece of tungsten carbide brick right next to the core, instantly causing it to go critical. He received a massive dose rate of radiation and died weeks later. A year later or so, Lewis Sultan was working, and there's no other way to put this, he was pissing about with the same core, showing off to some colleagues when his screwdriver slipped, allowing two plates to shut and triggering a massive cascade event. He died of what one of his colleagues referred to as 3D sunburn about 19 days later in absolute agony. With his permission, his demise was filmed as a dire warning to all future generations of nuclear physicists, and it is, as far as I know, still shown to training courses today. 
The core in question was now dubbed the Demon Core, and as rapidly as possible it was scheduled to be destroyed in a nuclear test in 1946, although I am confused as to whether or not that actually happened. I have contradictory reports. It may have been, or it may have been melted down and then used in a test later on. first major incident that we know of handling completed nuclear weapons was on the 13th of February 1950 on a B-36, which was truly one of the ugliest aircraft ever to fly. About seven hours into a long 14-hour training mission, Ice built up on the carburettors and a number of the engines began to flame out. The crew was forced to jettison their Mark IV bomb over the Pacific Ocean. It's never actually been found. Fortunately, the early Mark IVs and then the later Mark VI bombs had cores which were inserted in flight, which means that they were mostly inert without the plutonium or uranium pits. And although the explosives could go off, and potentially that would be really bad if you were close to them, you were unlikely to get a real nuclear release. That same year, there were four more serious incidents, including three crashes and one bomb release over water. It was becoming clear, to use the phrase from the communist lexicon, that there were some suboptimal outcomes around there, not least because someone could fail to remove the core having inserted it, at which point the slightest bang could set the bomb off. A bang it might sustain, say, whilst being taken out of a bomb bay and put on a handling cart, which then subsequently fell in a ditch, which happened six times in 1953 alone. Eventually, after much moaning, the Army and the Air Force agreed to have trajectory-sensing pistons put into the bombs, which could at least eliminate the chances of the damn things going off if they got dropped from a low height, and required them to, for example, experience the jerk of an opening parachute. In 1957, the Armed Forces Special Weapons Project created a series of design parameters and looked at the probabilities of an accidental nuclear detonation. Firstly, it described each kind of weapon a time factor during which it could theoretically deal with a serious fire, which gave firefighters a chance to try and tackle any blazes. These were largely theoretical, as the Air Force and Navy weren't that keen for anybody to conduct real-world tests by setting one of their shiny new nuclear weapons on fire. Secondly, it set acceptable odds of detonation at 1 in 10 million, which sounds great, but... If you assume that each bomb had a lifespan of, say, 10 years, and that there were, and indeed are, about 10,000 bombs in storage at any one time, the odds change from 1 in 10 million to 1 in 1,000. Those numbers are quite different. And as they assumed that you would put them in storage and leave them there, what this didn't account for was anybody picking up the objects and moving them around. So the AFSW went back about six months later and did a second highly classified report. They concluded that if something didn't change, then the chances of a hydrogen bomb exploding was about one in five between 1957 and 1970. And the chances of an atom bomb exploding by accident in the mainland United States was 100%. It was going to happen. These sorts of challenges can be summed up by the concept of always never. That is, ideally, nuclear weapons should always go off when you want them to and never go off when you don't want them to. Except clearly those things are under tension from one another. And in reality, if the military was going to make a choice, and this really held true up until the 1990s, they would always err on the side of all ways because of the perceived threat from the Soviet Union. The bombs must go off. And if it meant that they sometimes had accidents, that was an acceptable price to pay. To make these weapons more usable and available, nuclear bombs were stored across the world in so-called igloos. I mean, typically these were put at the edge of runways at major air force bases. In 1956, at RAF Lake and Heath in Suffolk, a B-46 bomber... Uh, right, this is Lord Hardthrasher here, post-production. I made a slight cock up there. Uh, the aircraft in question was actually a B-47, not a B-46. As far as I know, there is no such thing as a B-46. It's been a long day. I've had quite a lot to drink, so sorry. Anyway, as you were, carry on crashed into one of those igloos, spraying burning jet fuel all over the Mark VI bombs inside, some of which were fused and armed. Cars filled with American service personnel and their families were encountered by firefighters going hell for leather the other way away from their base. By an act of pure providence and not a little bravery by local fire teams, the explosives on the Mark VI did not detonate and shower eastern England with enriched uranium and plutonium. On the 31st of January 1958, at Sid Selimov in Morocco, a B-47 carrying a 10 megaton Mark 36 hydrogen bomb suffered a tyre blowout during takeoff practice. For reasons beyond all human understanding, the bomb had got a core in it and was basically ready to be dropped. The plane broke up, it caught fire, and firefighters fought it for about 10 minutes, well beyond the recommended time factor, before the base commander called the effort off and told the entire base to evacuate. 
The fire burnt for about two and a half hours and there was no detonation. The weapon melted into slag on the runway and was mostly disposed of in the heart of the desert, actually without the Moroccan government's knowledge. There wasn't proper radiation testing equipment in the area and to this day nobody knows how bad the contamination rate actually was. In February 1958, the US Air Force managed to drop a Mark VI Abn bomb onto a farm in South Carolina when a locking pin bail failed on the B-47. The weapon fell out of its rack onto and then through the bomb bay doors, almost taking the co-pilot with it. He'd actually been in the bomb bay at the time, trying to get it to lock back into its rack. It didn't have a core, but the explosives did go off and it blew a 50-foot crater in the ground. Had it been armed, it would have had a yield, ton, a yield of about 8 kilotons. In fact, things were much worse than these three examples might suggest, and at a top secret report for Rand in 1958 showed that a nuclear weapon was jettisoned by crews about once every 320 flights. B-52s seemed to crash about once every 20,000 hours. And these were critical statistics at that moment in time. This was the point when the US Air Force was just beginning what were referred to as airborne alerts, or what later became known as Operation Chrome Dome. That is having bombers in the air 24 hours a day, fully fueled, fully armed and ready to go. These were live weapons and they were ready to respond to an immediate Soviet Union strike. Indeed, they often flew along the borders of the Soviet Union, ready to turn in and go and make an attack run. By the late 1950s, most of these early generations of bombs with removable cores had been retired and were replaced with what was called sealed pit weapons. These were, by their very nature, sealed as a unit, meaning no weapons officer needed to handle highly radioactive material to arm or disarm the bombs, because they were always armed, which you can probably spot the problem. An electrical signal, signal in the right place could now be guaranteed to detonate the weapon. Theoretically, the bombs were controlled by a simple cockpit arming device called a T249. An operator opened the box, toggled the switch from safe to air or ground, and the bomb was armed. No codes, no keys, no complicated checklists, no funny signals. It just was armed. If you forgot to put it back on to safe during, say, an in-flight emergency or an unexpected landing, or simply because you'd been in the flat in the air for 24 hours and you were tired, it would stay armed. In early 1961, a crew unloading four Mark 28 hydrogen bombs from a B-47 in North Carolina found that they were all armed, despite the T-249 being set to safe. As one might imagine, a certain amount of panic ensued as they tried to figure out what had happened, and Sandia Labs did an investigation which eventually showed after seven months that a five-cent screw had come loose and shorted out the wiring next to a radar heating panel, which had created a bypass. This is the sort of screw which might come loose during, say, I don't know, a crash, maybe? One of the most famous incidents occurred during an airborne alert on the 24th of January 1961. A B-52 over Goldsboro, North Carolina, broke up mid-air, killing three of its seven crew. As the plane went down, two Mark 39 hydrogen bombs were released when centrifugal forces pulled a lanyard in the cockpit. One bomb fell harmlessly to the earth and broke up. The other, however, had a very different journey earthward. Firstly, its arming wires were yanked out as it left the plane and the bomb went partially armed. It reacted as though it had been dropped deliberately over a target, so the pulse generators fired up and that started the first set of thermal batteries. The drogue chute then opened and then the main chute, the barometric switches shut, the main batteries went live exactly as they should have and the bomb hit the ground and its piezoelectric crystals in the nose crushed and sent the detonation signal. It didn't go off only because a single, easily spoofed switch in that T249 was still set to safe. Had it gone off, there's a good chance that Washington DC, just as JFK took office, would have been irradiated and there'd be a fucking great big hole over Goldsboro, North Carolina. And it wasn't just aircraft that were suffering problems. In June 1960, a fire on a BOMAC 8 kiloton ground-to-air launch missile site burnt for 15 hours without detonating the warhead. Fortunately, it dropped out and became radioactive slag. The clear-up and, cont and containment operation went on well into the 2010s, as firefighters had used significant quantities of water which had actually thrown radioactive waste over a very wide area. Twice in 1962, Thor medium-range missiles were test-fired and had to be remotely destroyed due to failures, leading to a significant spread of radioactive materials over a range. This meant that the 20 Thor missile squadrons that had been deployed to the UK at the time were as likely to be as much of a hazard to the UK as they were to the Soviet Union in the event of a war, and so the weapons were retired in 1963. In 1964, a Minuteman fired its separation bolts due to corrosion, and the warhead fell off the weapon and down the launch tube, and so on, and so on, and so on. 
There were something like 40 serious incidents between 1960 and 1980 involving static and mobile missiles, about one every six months. Some of these were very, very serious, some of them were fairly minor. And there were high-profile screw-ups elsewhere. A crash over Palomares in 1966 saw four Mark 28 nuclear weapons, each with sealed pit design warheads, drop from a B-52 onto Spanish territory. Two of the bomb's explosive primaries went off, throwing radiation over quite a wide area, but not generating a nuclear yield. One dropped harmlessly into a riverbed, and the last fell into the ocean, requiring a weeks-long hunt to try and recover it. A crash at Thule Air Force Base in Greenland in 1968 was at first sight just a run-of-the-mill nuclear weapons accident, if such a thing exists. A fire on board the B-52s flying above the base forced the crew to try and land, but things got so bad on approach that the pilot had to order the crew to bail out. The explosive detonators on the four Mark 28 bombs did go off, showering a large area with radioactive material but not causing a nuclear yield. The scary bit of all of that was that the B-52 in question was there to make sure that Thule Air Force Base still existed. This was a 24 hours a day vigil, making sure that the most critical and northerly Air Force Base in, NATO, in the NATO alliance was still around and that the Soviets hadn't wiped it off the map. The assumption being that it would get hit first. Had the bombs gone off on that B-52 and removed Thule from the map, US Strategic Air Command and North American Air Defense would have had to assume that the US was indeed under attack from the Soviet Union and recommend a full nuclear release to President Johnson. That it didn't happen was down to a deliberate weak link in the design of the bombs. Following the Thule incident, a report by Sandia Labs in the US, who were deeply involved in weapons development themselves, showed that between 1950 and 1968, there were at least 1,200 significant incidents and accidents involving nuclear weapons. And it was becoming clear that a major overhaul of how bombs were designed was needed, led by Bill Stevens in the Sandia Lab, began to look at abnormal environments in detail, pointing out that during a single incident, a bomb could be crushed, burned, hit by debris, moved at extreme speeds, come to an extreme stop, and so on, and so on, and so on. Knowing about how these weapons would react was vital to safety. So they set about torturing the various, fortunately unarmed, weapons, and it became clear that there was some quite funky and weird stuff that could happen in extreme circumstances. Circuit boards that fused together, solder that would melt and then reform, creating new electrical pathways, fiberglass insulators that suddenly became conductors, junction boxes that allowed multiple connections across safe and armed settings, materials that suddenly became so fragile that they would shatter or would heat and cool in unexpected ways, plastics that deformed in unpredictable fashions, and so on and so on and so on. From this, three basic principles of nuclear safety were developed. First, incompatibility, that is arming signals that were too complicated to be spoofed by sim simple short circuits or stray wires. Second, isolation, that is a physical barrier to stop fire or electric signals and that kind of thing. And these together became known as a strong link. The third principle was inoperability, that is firing a particular part in the wrong sequence would cause another part to fail if the wrong signal was sent. This is known as weak link, and together the system was called a weak link strong link design. Furthermore, the use of traditional high explosives like Torpax was increasing the risk of nuclear detonation and had on multiple occasions spread radiation over a significant area when part of de partial detonations had occurred. Sandia recommended that insensitive explosives were adopted. These are ones that require very extreme or very specific kinds of environments to explode and won't, for example, catch fire or explode in the event you drop them. Starting in 1974, various influential figures in the nuclear weapons community began to campaign for the adoption of weak link, strong link designs, the use of insensitive explosives, the removal of sealed pits designs, and an overhaul of the US stockpiles. In 1980, a Titan II missile blew up in its silo after a fuel leak, and the warhead was thrown intact more than 150 feet into the air before crashing back down to Earth. It had come within a hair's breadth of triggering a 10 megaton explosion in the heart of the US Midwest. And whilst nobody in Washington has ever particularly cared if one of the flyover states got irradiated, the thought did occur to them that if it could happen there, it could happen anywhere. And suddenly minds across government woke up to just how dangerous these weapons could be, even if they weren't fired. It took years of hard campaigning and a great deal of general whining and pushback, but as of 2023, most warheads in the US do now contain the kinds of designs principles that were put down in 1974. Most, but not all. Most notably, the Trident II missiles carried on US and Royal Navy submarines. So here's a comforting thought. Pissed up Glaswegian dock handlers have to handle one of the least safe warheads in the Western world. And I, for one, will feel a lot better about that and sleep 
very well at night. It's also worth noting that the reason that the US Senate continues to give for not signing the Global Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty is because of safety, claiming that they need to test these things to make sure that they're safe and not, you know, to more effectively remove Moscow from world history or whatever. I'm sure that's nothing to do with it. So that's been a jolly little jaunt through nuclear weapon safety, and I hope you've at least learned something. Um, look, I, I strongly recommend reading or listening to Eric Schlosser's brilliant Command and Control, which goes into a lot more detail and for which I've drawn quite heavily for this video. I also recommend not worrying too much about this stuff. If you find yourself standing next to a Minuteman missile and it starts making hissing noises, there's not a lot of point in running away. And likewise, if Mr. Putin decides to ruin everyone's day, well, probably in the UK all will know about it as a big bright flash and then not a lot else. If you're in the US, it could be more complicated, but actually there's a really good chance he can't hit the US anymore. And again, I could talk about that at some point in the future. If you've enjoyed this and you want me to do another one about nuclear weapons strategy and how it changed over the Cold War, I'd be happy to do so in a few weeks' time. Have a lovely day. Go and hug someone who survived the 60s and the 70s. They have no right to be here.